everybody. Uh, we are up for our second uh, plenary session. We have with us Connie Jacobs, who is a professor emerita at San Juan College in New Mexico. So we're welcoming her very warmly, as has been the case with all the other participants, but especially yes, those who are connecting us from from abroad. I, I think they they deserve yes a warmest wel welcome to the to the conference. So Connie has been around for quite some time, and she's one of the top specialists in in uh, Louis Edridge, and. She will be telling us more broadly today about, uh, uh, well, her title is uh, White, or oh, sorry, Witches and Red Devils, The Birth of Fear Narratives in Colonial America. So we're going to hear, she's going to be taking us, I think, on a, on a long trip around Mesoamerica and other places around. So that's very welcome now that we are here encapsulated <laughs> in our little machines. So that will be very welcome. But let me just say a few words about her scholarly trajectory. She has uh, two well-knowns, the novels of Louise Edridge, Stories of Her People, and another one that she co-edited with Craig Saris and James Giles, uh, Approaches to Teaching the Work. Both of them are so widely used, yes? Approaches to Teaching the Works of Louise Edridge. On top of that, she's contributed with chapters to several other books, Louise Edridge, Colin tracks the last report on the miracles at Little No Horse and Plague, uh, Plague of Doves. And another chapter, which was edited by Deborah Madsen, another chapter in the Native American Renaissance, Literary Imagination and Achievement, which was edited by Alan Valley and A. Robert Lee. So these are all well-known scholars. Right now she's working, I think, on at least three or four different uh, books as well as editor. So as I said, she's well recognized as one of the top names regarding not only Etrich but Native American uh, literature in general. And to complete my introduction, let me read just a short excerpt. This is by Deborah Barker, which is probably rings a bell to Connie, but she wrote a, a review on her book, The Novels of Louise Eldridge, and this is what Deborah said about the book. This is not only the most comprehensive survey of Louise Eldridge's fiction to date, it is also the most carefully researched. And that says something about the kind of work that Connie normally does. Jacobs has provided us with the kind of historical and cultural background not usually found in critical studies of Native American writers. Therefore, her contribution to the field is most valuable, particularly to readers desiring an overview of Ferdinand's fiction, as well as an introduction to Ferdinand's and Ishinabe cultural perspective. And it is true that that book marries so well the cultural, the historical, different elements in, in Edrich's uh, work. Last sentence, exploring the mythic and cultural landscapes of Edrich's novels, Jacobs provides important links between Edrich's fictional and mythic narratives, underscoring Edrich's role as a tribal storyteller committed to her cultural survival of her, to the cultural survival, sorry, of her nation. And that's the end of the, of the quote. So I don't want to take, I have plenty of materials there, but I don't want to take more time from, I mean, it is, she's going to be, it is a luxury to have you with us, yes? And you are going to be, of course, the protagonist. And um, as I said, the title of her talk today is Witches and Red Devils, the birth of her fear, uh, the birth of fear narrative, sorry, in, in colonial America. So let me just, try to share the pictures so that uh, you can tell me when to move on with them. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Natura. And thank you too for your, you and your committee for allowing me to speak at this conference. I'm very honored to have been asked. And I only wish that the conference was in person so I could be there with you in Spain in Valpo. I was really looking forward to that. And if I might add as a note, I do have another book coming out at the end of this year 
on Louise Erdrich's Justice Trilogy, which is La Rose, Roundhouse, and Plague of Doves. And Atora has an article in there, a very excellent article, and that's how I got to meet him. So uh, we are very connected through Louise Erdrich. I'm glad she brought us together. So, Witches and Red Devils, The Birth of Fear Narratives in Colonial America. Look at this picture. American citizens assaulting our capital. Those good Americans who were shocked at the January 6, 2021 attempted takeover of the Capitol, still one, please, in order to stop Congress from certifying Joe Biden's election. Go back one, please. Slide one. Uh, I'm seeing a slide one now. Oh, okay. You're mine, seeing mine, two? Yeah, mine flipped. Okay. So if those good American citizens were shocked at what happened on the 21st in uh, January um, when Congress was certifying Joe Biden's election as the 46th president of the United States, those folks either had not been reading their American history, their, they had not been reading different news sources, or they'd slept through their courses in school on history. On that day, the Proud Boys, the 1776 Project, Oath Keepers, Women for America First, and MAGNA, which is Make America Great Again, and other various pro-Trump groups were urged to violence by the promise of their leaders, and especially by the violence of their grand provocateur of fear narratives, then-President Donald J. Trump. The only other time in history that the revered congressional building came under attack was in 1814 during the 1812 war. And that's when British troops sacked and burned the Capitol. Those were declared enemies. This attack was by disgruntled American citizens. Now, why did these thousands of rioters feel compelled to make an assault on the physical representation of America's democracy? Well, it's because former President Trump pandered to their fears and fed them misinformation via social media throughout his entire presidency. The Washington Post Online, one of America's most reputable newspapers, reported that fact checker counted 30,573 false or misleading statements that Donald Trump made while serving as president. Now, just think about that. Over 30,000 false or misleading statements. Then, when Trump lost the 2020 presidency, by a wide margin, he spread the lie that he had won the election, which is a cliched and predictable claim of a demagogue losing his power. His slogan became, Stop the Steal. He rallied his supporters by urging them to retake their America. And in one of his most infamous tweets since the week before Christmas of 2020, the president wrote, big po protest in DC, January 6th, be there, we'll be wild. Trump warned his followers of the dire consequences for them of a new liberal multicultural administration. What the insurrectionists had in common was they were predominantly Caucasian, lower middle class, male, racist, xenophobic, and their goal to return their country to a patriarchal, white supremacist America, which they felt belonged to them. Trump roused these rioters to a violent fury with his four-year barrage of hate and fear-mongering. New York Times columnist Charles Blow takes a hard look at Trump's tactics. He, Trump, knows, as politicians have known before, how white fear of violence can be exploded, exploited and used as a political tool. He has done it before and he will do it again. Blow, an African-American intellectual, continues, white people still for now are the majority of the population and hold the lion's share of the country's power. Trump knows that if he can convince enough of them that they are under threat, that their personal safety their way of life, their heritage, and their hold on power are in danger, they will, re they will act to protect what they have. And so they did. Trump succeeded in tapping into these basic fear narratives. The insurrectionists felt they had found a leader who finally spoke for them 
and as Trump loyalists believed in all that he told them. This is what New York Times columnist David Brooks calls the politics of mean world. He explains, mean world thrives on fear and perpetuates itself by exaggerating fear. Its rhetorical play is catastrophizing and its tone is apocalyptic. Trump Brooks sums up his argument. The upshot of the mean world war is the obliteration of normal politics, the hollowing of the center, and the degradation of public morality. Under the cover of souped up, screw or be screwed mentality, norms are eviscerated, truth is massacred, bigotry is justified, and the politics turns into a struggle to culturally obliterate the other side. Professor of philosophy Ron Scaff at the College of St. Vincent Mount St. Victor in New York, analyzes Trump's presidency. Trump made his ambitions and aspirations loud and clear to serve himself. In the process, he has advanced and amplified white supremacy, patriarchy, Christian nationalism, and unfettered capitalism, all of which has fired up his base and beyond. Thousands of his Supporters rallied to his cry to fight for what was most deservingly theirs. And so on January 6, 2021, Scap goes on to report the white supremacist, Christian nationalist, patriarchal, and free market caste elitists were together in their demonization and hate for all things, everyone non white, non Christian, non sexist, and not a supporter of a free market system. Prophetically, columnist blow of August of 2020, five months before the January insurrection, had written a powerful article on how Trump is not the first, nor will he sadly be the last of the racist, fear-mongering American politicians. Blow explains, the use of white fear and white victimhood as potential political weapons is as old as the country itself. Donald Trump is just the latest practitioner of this trade. Fear narratives throughout American history have been a prevailing tool of the powerful to keep their individual groups united against a perceived common enemy. And this paper traces those origins back to the founding of European America in the 17th century. Now, America has its origin story an inspiring story of poor, devout Christians fleeing an intolerant church authorities who would persecute them for their nonconformist beliefs. These intrepid souls braved high seas, left behind family and livelihood to come to a new uninhabited land where they could build a Christian nation and a city of God in the wilderness. However, as origin stories go, while there are truths to this account, they are also competing untruths that often get lost in the grand narrative. This is the case in the founding of America story, which the Pilgrims founding of America story. Sorry. which the Pilgrims, Puritans, and countless generations of Americans have promulgated as truth throughout the ages. Now, here's the more realistic version of the beginning of European, here's the more realistic version of the beginning of the European colonies, which eventually became known as America. When the early American settlers arrived in the New World, rather than finding an empty wilderness, they entered an immense land, which, according to ethno-historian Henry Dobbins, since 1500 had been populated with between 7 and 15 million people living in what today is known as the United States. The indigenous people of this land spoke over 400 different languages and had thousands of distinct cultures and social groups. Furthermore, archaeologists conservatively cite 20,000 years as the length of time indigenous people had inhabited this land. While this was also the time of the European Renaissance, in the Americas at this time, 
There were also impressive architectural, artistic, agricultural, and political achievements. <laughs> yeah, thank you. In South America, Peru's Machu Picchu showcases the Inca's great achievement of the 15th century. Today, five centuries later, Machu Picchu is considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site and, and is considered among the greatest artistic, agricultural, architectural land use achievements anywhere and the most tangible legacy of the Inca civilization. Three, of special importance are the hundreds of terraces built on the side of a mountain at 2,400 meters. Four, used to control water and to grow crops for both the uh, emperor and the common people who served him. Anthropologist Jack Weatherford, six, makes a magnitude of the Inca's accomplishment. This task would be the equivalent of hauling dirt from the Colorado River to plant fields on top of the Grand Canyon, which is over 2,000 meters. Six, to the north in Mexico, monumental architectural sites abound. The Olmec heads are made from basalt boulders, which stand between 1.2 and 3.5 meters. And they date back about 900 BC. These heads are considered one of the most impressive feats from ancient Mesoamerica. Another nine, another great wonder, seven and eight, please. Yeah, here they are digging up an Olmec head. And here, here's an Olmec head. It's interesting. It's a um, replica that they put in a <laughs> zoo. Um, okay. Uh, nine. Another impressive wonder is Teotihuacan, a Mexican, ugh, isn't that gorgeous? Teotihuacan, a Mesoamerican pyramid built around 500 to 100 AD, thousands of years before the arrival of the Aztecs. This site is considered one of the most impressive and significant architectural sites in pre-Columbian America and boosts several monumental structures and housed a population of 100,000 at its peak. 10. Palenque at the late classic dates from around 600 to 900 AD. It too is considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its several monumental structures. The discovery of hieroglyphics in the Temple of the Inscriptions was a very, very rare treasure as it opened up several hundred years of Mayan history, which told of trade, alliances, and even marriages. 11, the, the Temple of the Feathered Servant is considered one of the most significant architectural works in pre-Columbian America. 12, and here is that temple and 13, or here, uh, the Temple of the Feathered Servant, which is just, look at that. I mean, it's just fantastic. Okay. Okay. Um, 15, 14, I'm sorry. Yeah. Chinzen Itza from the terminal period is another one of the great seven wonders of the world. At its peak, it was the most populated city in the Yucatan Peninsula and considered by scholars to be one of the great mythical cities. It included a great pyramid, 15. Here's, a, here's sort of a map of um, everything that's there. 16, a temple, a great pyramid. Look at that, a temple, ball courts, and a special interest an observatory for astronomical events. Scholars emphasize the important contributions of the Mayans. The Mayans were skilled farmers and created a very sophisticated written language. Some think it may be the first written language of the Americas. The Maya also developed a well-ordered social class system and carried on trade throughout a network of cities 
It went as far north as Central Mexico and as far south as Panama. They were expert mathematicians. Their number system included the concept of zero, an idea that was known even to the Greeks who were expert mathematicians. The Maya used their mathematical knowledge along with the celestial observations to finesse a calendar created by the Olmec and to create monuments to observe and commemorate movements of the sun, moon, and Venus. Spectacular examples of these monuments still can be seen at Chinsen Itza. 17. The indigenous people of North America were also creators of monumental architecture, most notably the Mississippian Mounds, Chaco Canyon, and Mesa Verde. And these date back to about 3000 AD. The Mississippian Mounds stretch from the Great Lakes through the Mississippi and Ohio Valleys and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. They are great earthworks, which the indigenous people used as burial sites, ceremonial centers, and residence for political and religious leaders. The seat of the power was in Cahokia, the site of Monk's Mound, which this is showing. It was 30 meters high. It's a flat top pyramid, and it was surrounded by 45 smaller pyramids, as well as markets, and plazas. The entire area was uh, covered about 16 acres. Weather Ford, um, Jack Weatherford, the anthropologist, details its importance. No other structure in the United States approached the size of the Cahokia Pyramid until the building of skyscrapers in the 20th century. At around 2, 1260, Cahokia had more than 2,000 residents, 20, I'm sorry, 20,000 residents, which was larger than London and ranked as one of the great urban centers of the world. All right, 18, I'll show you a few more pictures of, um, this is one of uh, the villages, 19. Um, that little dot there is, it's Southern Illinois. And that's where this was. And then uh, 20, this shows you the whole area of the Mississippian cultures. I mean, it, it looks, it's about one third of the United States. You see, it covers a great deal of the Midwest and especially the Southeast. Um, Chaco Canyon, 23 or 21. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. And the village. Yeah, another one of the village. Okay, 22. Oh, here we are back in the southwest. This is where I live. Chaco Canyon in New Mexico is the UNESCO World Heritage Site and considered the center of the ancestral Puebloan culture. And unlike the mound builders of the Midwest with the rich farmland and large rivers, providing not only water, but also trade routes, Chaco Canyon lies in a desert with little rainfall and short growing seasons. Yet, like the mound builders, it was the hub of extensive trade routes, which reached from the Pacific coast all the way to Mexico, Mexico as verified by shells, as well as macaw feathers found in ceremonial sites, which are called kivas. Chaco served as a commercial, political, and ceremonial center. There are more than uh, 644 kilometers of roads which connect Chaco to some 75 surrounding communities. And what's so fascinating about these roads is that they are laid out in straight lines, regardless of the terrain. The level of engineering and sophistication needed to accomplish this is just noteworthy. Chaco's outstanding features include its unique stone masonry, T-shaped doorways, abundant great kivas, which are those underground ceremonial centers, and which sometimes those rooms were 14 meters in diameter. They also had check dams and diversion walls that directed scarce water sources to agricultural areas and they had an observatory. The largest of the 15 great houses in Chaco Canyon is what you see here now. This is Pueblo Benito with 800 rooms and a population 
of about a thousand residents at its peak. Chaco is distinguished by its scale and sophistication of economy, trade, economics, which were unmatched in the region. 23. Yeah, there's another example. I haven't read this article, but I thought it's pretty cool. I don't think they did, but perhaps. All right, 24. Now we're in Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde is 30 minutes from my house, and this is an area I know well. I hope you all sometime, if you have not seen it, can visit it. This is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's also an ancestral Pueblo site, but its inhabitants, rather than living on top of the mesa, they farm there, but they live in, in the great house, in the houses, in the cliff dwellings. There was game where they hunted in the valley, and there was also water. Around 1200, the people did move from their Pueblo homes on top to these rock dwellings, and they lived there over 700 years. The 33 cliff dwellings of Cliff Canyon and Fox Canyon are unique in that they contained close to 550 rooms and 60 kin kivas, serving about 600 to 800 people who shared very close quarters. These dwellings were accessed by the several roads that led from the valley floor up to the different dwellings. 26. Uh, on Weatherhelm Mesa, it probably represents the population peak during the 13th century. And it stood five stories high in some places and had 150 rooms, 21 kivas, and, and 21 kivas. The people lived in the center and the back areas in the family units, and they usually had one small area designated for storage. Daily tasks, such as making clothes, pottery, grinding corn, butchering animals, both large and small, were done both inside and outside um, on the living area in the, uh, their common areas. Additionally, there were water sources from seepages from the back of the caves. Now, while these ancient architectural monuments continue to inspire us today with their grandeur and craftsmanship, a more direct contribution of the pre-Columbian people of the Americas to people today was the plants they grew, which, according to Weatherford, created a food revolution. According to Weatherford, the American Indians cultivated over 300 food crops. The people of the Old World gradually transplanted many of these crops from the Americas, and in turn, this contributed in varying ways to improving the world diet, both in quantity and in quality of foods. Now, these are the foods. The potato. At the time of the Spanish conquest, Andean farmers already were producing about 3,000 different types of potatoes. Number two, the three sisters, corn, bean, and squash. And those of you who are gardeners will know that these are best planted by companion planting. Number three, amaranth. Number four, quinoa. Number five, avocado. Number six, chocolate. Number seven, peppers. Number eight, tom tomatoes. Today, about 60% of our food worldwide came from the Americas. Also, you might want to note that tobacco came from the New World. It was cultivated in central uh, Mexico. In addition to monumental architecture, extensive trade routes, and superb adaptations to their environment, the indigenous people of the Americas are also known for their complex political and spiritual systems, as well as their beautifully made baskets, pottery, jewelry, well-designed tools, totem poems, and canoes. Now, at this point, you may reasonably be asking the question, what do these architectural, agricultural, and artistic achievements of pre-Columbian indigenous people of the Americas have to do with fear narratives? Well, in fact, that is the question to ask. The settlers came from Europe for several reasons. They were the opportunists, there were the opportunists, as well as those who believed they were fulfilling 
a God-given mission to build a new pure Christian society. The colonists believed that they would find a pastoral land uncorrupted by humans for them to make into their vision of a Christian nation. The indigenous people the colonists encountered were most unexpected and most unwanted as the settlers believed America was theirs to cultivate. These Europeans immediately presumed their superiority over the people they found living on the lands they had anticipated as their own. And yes, you should read here, Caucasian settlers, indigenous people of various earth tone skin colors. The language of early explorers and settlers in America set the tone in their writing for centuries of fear narratives regarding the indigenous people on whose lands they were settling. John Smith was an adventurer who joined the Jamestown ex Exhibition of 1607, and his book, The General History of Virgin Virginia, New, New England, is one of the earliest books published in 1624 about the colonies. In chapter two of his book, this is the language he uses when referring to the members of the Chesapeake Bay Indian savages, like devils, grim couriers, barbarous, devils, fiends, more like a devil than a man and stern barbarians. Upon hearing and seeing one of their ceremonies in the woods, he described it as the people yelling out such hellish notes and screeches being strangely painted. Smith was captured by the Indians, but saved by Pocahontas, the daughter of their king, Powhatan. Now, whether or not this last adventure was true or fabricated, and scholars now think it's fabricated, nevertheless, the writings of Smith and his hairbreadth escape has become one of the best known pieces of literature in the North American exploration and his vilifying descriptions of indigenous people that he countered, those have endured. William Bradford was a pilgrim who came to the New World in 1620 on the Mayflower, and he served as governor of the colony off and on for over 30 years. In his most famous work, A Plymouth Plantation, these are the words he uses to describe the indigenous people and the world in which they lived, barbarians, savage barbarians who lived in a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men, the whole country full of woods and thickets, which represented a wild and savage hue. Even though the Wampanoag tribe helped the original pilgrims through a hard winter and taught them to farm, the indigenous people were treated as the enemy from the beginning. Now granted, the indigenous people of the 17th century were not living in monumental housing of a past classical period, but the colonists had no idea of the rich history and accomplishments of the indigenous people. But even if they did know of their rich history and accomplishments, they wouldn't have cared. The historian Edmundo O'Gorman found that the native cultures of the newly found lands could not be recognized and respected in their own right as an original way of realizing human ideals and values, but only realized for the meaning that they might have in relation to Christian European cultures. America was invented in the image of its inventor. Let me repeat that. America was invented in the image of its inventors. The tribes on whose lands the settlers were spreading reasonably felt threatened, as did the colonists who wanted their, the land for their own. The outcome was, of course, war. From the beginning, the odds were stacked in favor of the colonists who brought with them several weapons which gave them the advantage, not only guns, but diseases. Sources list over 150 Indian wars, scrimmages, and battles starting in 1540 with the Tewish War in New Mexico between Coronado and the Puebloan people and lasting to the Apache Wars of 1924. War brought death and destruction to both sides, 
but the indigenous people were gradually outnumbered and decimated by disease and the repeating rifle. It's understandable that the original settlers feared for their life from the rotting savages. With all the terrors both sides inc incurred, and I'd like to note at this point that scalping was introduced to the Indians by the French and the British. The fact that the indigenous people had their own spiritual practices and were not Christian made them easy targets for elimination by the settlers. Using the constant fear of Indian attacks became an effective tool, not only of religious leaders, but also of village leaders to keep their populations united and governable. These fear narratives arising from the colonist fear of those red devils living in the dark and dangerous wilderness inform the American consciousness from the earliest settlements and lasted through Western expansion as settlers continued to stake their claims on native lands and native people fought back to protect their homes, lands, and heritage. If you think of the dime store, what we call dime store novels, those are the pulp novels about the uh, Western Westerns and the Western movies, the Indians were always the bad guy. The wars finally were decisively ended because of disease, measles, smallpox, and flu, which decimated 90% of the indigenous population. Then the U.S. government stepped in and forcibly removed the remaining tribes to reservations where they could control them. The Indian Wars were over. <coughs> Another fear narrative that shaped the psyche of the original colonists was the fear of witches who were thought to live in the dark wilderness where the red devils resided. This fear was imported from Europe, where between 1450 and 1750, an estimated 35,000 to 100,000 people, mostly women, were executed on the charges of witchcraft. Well, why? Well, contemporary scholars believe that the witchcraft trials were largely a result of religious and societal factors, as those accused of being witches usually were those who did not fit in to the Catholic norms of a Catholic society. Heinrich Kramer, an inquisitor and Catholic clergyman with his infamous book, Malleus Maleficarum, which is translated as The Hammer of the Witch, was published in 1487 and republished 30 times. This book significantly heightened the fear of witches and witchcraft throughout Europe. One of its major influences documented by Elizabeth Foster Feinenbaum, a semantic scholar at Trinity College, who found that he, Kramer, created the idea of the new medieval witch, an evil woman. That is the image that survives to this day. His book describes how to distinguish a witch and then punish them as well. This book is, was well known throughout Europe and radically changed the public perception of witchcraft from harmless to the devil's work. Foster Feinenbaum explains the significance of Kramer's book. The precursor to the highly popularized Salem witchcraft trials of the 17th century was the witch craze of medieval Europe. The infamous Salem witchcraft trials of 1692 to 1693 were born from several causes. The first being the fear of witches, this fear that the colonists brought from them as they settled in the New World. Additionally, these people lived in fear of the wilderness and the red devils who lived there. Fears that were spread by the original settlers and also by their experiences with Indian tax. Additionally, and most importantly, there were two major Indian wars taking place north of Salem. There was King Philip's War of 1675 to 78 and King William's War of 1688 to 1697. These wars predictably caused panic among the settlers and led many of them to flee from northern towns to uh, Salem. The reason for these wars? Well, by 1670, the 1670s, there were more than 50,000 English colonists living in New, 
in New England, and they were steadily encroaching on land held by the Native people. Community and religious leaders saw the hand of the devil in these attacks, which only heightened the ever-present fear of witches. How, they asked, could God-fearing people be victims of these repeated attacks by savages? Their attack, witches were in league with the Indians. Well, here are the basic facts of the Salem witchcraft trials. Number one, in January of 19, I'm sorry, 1692, two young girls living in the household of the Reverend Samuel Paris of Salem Village began having fits, which all attributed to witchcraft. Number two, as time passed, more and more villagers claimed that they too were victims of witchcraft. The claims included that they saw dead people who were directing witchcraft to kill them, and that they also saw the devil in the shape of, yes, an Indian. Three, the accusers linked the terrible Indian wars with the devil's workshop in the wilderness. Wartime fear of attacks by indigenous people caused witchcraft accusations to explode. Four, in the end, more than 150 people were accused of witchcraft. Of these, more than 40 accusers were from Andover and two other neighboring towns, not from Salem. Five, some of the accusers were between 11 and 20 years of age, and other accusers were aggrieved adults who sought vengeance against neighbors for, man wrong, for imagined wrongdoings and who really wanted the property these people held. Six, in the end, at least 144 people were jailed, 14 women and five men were hanged, and one man, Giles Corey, died by being pressed to death. In a quirk of the law, number seven, if an accused person claimed their innocence, they were usually sentenced to death. However, if an accused person confessed to being a witch, they were not executed because as a witch, they could then confess and name others. And eight, the men in charge of the witchcraft trials were both educated and proper landowners, as were some of the accused. The Salem witchcraft crisis, which began of January 9, 1692, dwindled to a close in May of 1693. As the testimony of the accusers became less and less credible when judges no longer allowed spectral evidence, the accusers' most powerful weapon. New judges replaced the old court, and gradually the majority of the accused were released from jail. The Salem witchcraft crisis, in retrospect, is an event that was caused by ignorance and fear, the ultimate source of most fear narratives. The Salem witchcraft trials and the fear of savage Indians were just the beginning of America's fear narratives, which set the foundation for fear-driven hysteria in the following century up to the present time. American history is replete with atrocious events happening because of fear, whether it was fear of immigrants arriving in the country, each group vilified for their religion or skin color, or just for being different from real Americans. The slave uprisings in the South before slavery was ended can find a direct descendant in the Black Lives Matter to movements today and the strong, vicious backlash against us. The Red Scare of 1950s was caused by a power-hungry Joseph, Senator Joseph McCarthy, who was able to whip the country into a frenzy as he kept accusing those in governmental positions who did not agree with him of being communist. He especially went after those in the entertainment uh, business. At the time that he won popular support for his extremism reflects how little America has learned from her past in discerning those who perpetuate fear narratives out of a sense of self-importance and a self-appointed mission to make America great again. Yes, the circle turns back to where we began with the assault on the Capitol this past January. What was driving these furious mobs driven to a frenzy was their president, who for four years had been feeding them the fear narrative that their America was in danger of being abducted by liberals 
immigrants and people of color. Well, ironically, Trump is correct on this point. As Isabel Wilkinson notes in her brilliant book, Cast, The Origins of Discontents, by 2042, non-whites will be the majority in America. What we're witnessing now is the white supremacist use of fear narratives to combat this coming reality. Fear narratives are always intertwined with power, those who have it and want to keep it, regardless of the cost. National unity for America is not realistic at this point. But the longer the white supremacist fights against the reality that pluralism is America, the weaker their case becomes. David Brooks, who was cited earlier, believes that President Joe Biden has set the stage for a moral revival. His values cut across the left-right, urban-rural cultural divide we've been enduring for a generation or more. The ever-optimistic Brooks writes that it's possible America may emerge from this trauma and generations of similar traumas more transformed than we can imagine. Let's hope he's right. America needs to come together or end up a splintered nation driven apart by fear narratives. Um, thank you. But I'd like to show you some, uh, uh, next slide please, some of the books that inform this talk that I highly, highly recommend to you. Uh, Jared uh, Diamonds, it was 1997, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Fabulous, fabulous book on, uh, fabulous book here in the Devil's Snare. Um, this is a recent book, a couple years ago, talks about the Salem witchcraft crisis. It's the latest, her latest theories on the book. And finally, uh, Cast, which I said, this is a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's a fabulous book. So I thank you very much, and I'd love to have any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Connie. Let me close the, the PowerPoint, and we will be receiving questions, I guess, in a minute from the audience. So please do the preguntas and respuestas uh, icon in order to send me your questions. Thank you for the very illuminating. I mean, how much ground you have managed <laughs> to cover in just 40, 45 minutes is unbelievable. And also the connections that you were making, no? Because at the beginning it wasn't clear how the pieces would fall into place. Yeah, yeah. So that was really interesting. But let us hope that there are questions from the audience. Is there any intention? Because you said now that at least here in Europe, uh, witches were primarily female. Uh, I don't know if that was the case in the Americas. But were you trying to bring together gender concerns with uh, ethnic concerns, or is that something that that maybe I, I was just uh, imagining? No, 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 no. There, there's always the, the gender when uh, you're uh, talking about issues like this. First of all, in Europe, it was thought that women, because they're the weaker sex, they would be more vulnerable to the wiles of the devil. And so mm -hmm. they were always more suspect. And um, there were women, as we know today, who do have magic. I, I don't know if magic is the right word, but they have powers. They can heal. Right. And they can do things that before the German in, 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 inquisitor got his hands you know, on a book and became so rigid about it, this was accepted. It was an accepted practice in uh, Europe, particularly it was in uh, Southern uh, Germany. But then when he brought the church into it, it no longer was, I don't wanna say harmless, but it was the healing magic. It's the power that some people have to make things mm -hmm. happen in ways that we can't explain. And it was, yes, it was usually women. And so when it came over here, it became the devil's work. And that's what he was saying. It's devil's work. Now, in the Salem witchcraft trials, it's interesting. Most of the accused were um, uh, women, but there were some men. But the men were the ones, the brothers, the sisters, the family members who stood up for those who were accused. 
-hmm. It was also people, men who had land. And it was just that fierce bite back, you know, bite backbiting that you sometimes get where people wanted their land and they were willing to do anything to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my students are reading The Crucible at the moment, which is a, a great, well, we're seeing in a course on adaptation, we are seeing how the, the play by Miller, which of course connects to McCarthy's, which is another period now, the red skirt. Right, <laughs> so. right. and it's interesting because of what, what I've mentioned here with McCarthy and the Black Lives Matter, and then the uh, fears of the Indians out West, you have papers on all of those. So it, it just all, all fits in together. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any questions. Uh, Savi, uh, yeah, five minutes to go, but should I be, where should I be seeing the questions? Maybe there aren't any. I know that it is late in the day. Yes, it's been an intense day. We still have oh, I, another I session. I have a question here. Oh. Um, do, you, do you think the Native American situation, well, what will you think it will be in the future? Is the re reservation system beneficial uh, to them? Oh, what a fabulous question. Um, the reservation system for some people um, is, it, it connects family, it connects land, it's their heritage. It's really important. And the best reservation systems, and there are many reservations in the Southwest where I live, are those where there is um, some kind of small industry where people can work and still be at home because they're practicing ceremonies, going home for ceremonies is still very important to a lot of traditional people. So the hope is now to get more and more um, opportunities for jobs so they don't have to leave the reservations. But as you probably know, the reservations are some of the poorest areas in the country with the highest incident of alcoholism, unemployment, abuse of all horrible, horrible, horrible kinds. And so, but people are working on it. I'm seeing really great progress. And, and the more people are educated, the more the people can be educated and the educated people come back to help setting up better infrastructures and letting the indigenous law take over, um, you know, replace some of the systems that are American systems that don't work as well for many um, indigenous people. But over, I think the, um, it's 60% now of indigenous people live off reservations right mm -hmm. now. So I'm hopeful though. I'm hopeful. I try, do you have, cause I have a Q and A yeah, here. I have, yeah, I have a list oh. of questions here. Okay. Another one is, which is somehow related to what I was saying before, any chance the fear of female witches was somehow related to inter interracial fear? So it's, I don't know. I haven't read that, have you? Well, that's uh, media. I, I haven't. Think, I, I haven't read about that. The, the women usually, uh, the witches usually were thought to be women, <laughs> um, and um, but no, I haven't. That's that's interesting. I'll have to look mm -hmm. that up. Uh, she means witches and sex with the devil. Oh, there's always that. They always throw in sex anytime you want to, you know make the women bad, it's because they've had sex with the devil. Yeah, that's sort of an old cliche trope, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you reading the questions yourself? Noelia is asking, why do you think this rhetoric of fear, so based on the fear of the other, has been so recurrent and effective in the US? Uh, well, beginning, as you said, in the 17th century, the Red Scares, we were talking about the capital assault. Will we see the end of it? Or is this ju just the repetitive rhetoric that happens? Is there a cyclicity to it in history? Well, there has been. <laughs> um, we can only hope that their heads prevail. And that's what... Uh, a very famous New York Times columnist, David Brooks, was saying he thinks that um, that President Biden can bring people together. But right now, you know, we still have the people of Trump supporters who want to overturn um, the progress 
they want to go back to where America is their version of America. And, and that's, we never were that. We've always been a pluralistic uh, society, mm-hmm. but they, they don't want to believe that. And how long will it continue? I don't know. I think it's until we have leaders who make it the priority and they have the uh, power in their government in, in, to make laws uh, that make uh, such atrocities um, as this last week, we've had two mass shootings. One in Denver, which near or Boulder, not far from me, and it was against um, that one. Was the, the in, uh, unfortunately the assaulter was an immigrant, and then when young man again sex based, he wanted to kill Asian women because they tempted him sexually, and so he just wanted to get rid of them so they wouldn't tempt others. So when is this going to end? I don't know. I mean, does Europe not have these problems or is that mostly our problem? No, I think it is somehow global. Perhaps there are more extreme cases, yes, in certain parts of the, of the, of the world, but, but it is true that, that we do have, no, with, we do have our fears, yes, related to migrate. In some cases they coincide with the US in other cases, they're, they're slightly different, but but I think it is not something that is just happening there. I mean, yeah. most people would agree that that uh, there are other localities around Europe now that are in danger of, of suffering from the same type of, of illness, of social illnesses and political illnesses. Right. Yeah, so I think I until if- we have leaders um, and the will of the people that they want to change, and it can happen, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not happening now, but I, I'm seeing hopeful signs, so. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't see any more questions coming and I think we are about on time to complete. There is still another simultaneous session of, of panels, which will begin in about five minutes. So Connie, we really appreciate your contribution to the to the conference. It was, as I said, a luxury to have you with us. Uh, I will be inviting you to come over to Bilbao <laughs> and visit us physically. That's something on our agenda. So I'm taking note of that. And I accept. Of, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and best of luck with all those projects that you have in your hands at the moment. Yes. Yes. Which... And thank you for your contribution to the Earth okay. book. Okay. Okay, thank you so so much. It was a pleasure. Okay, we'll be seeing you probably in some of the other sessions. Yes, so now everybody should be going to the to the next session, which will begin, as I said, in five minutes. Thank you very much for being there, everybody. Bye bye. 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 See you, Connie. Bye bye.